Thanks, Makran. Thank you, actually, Ankit, Makran, Tony, for organizing this fabulous workshop. And thank you for inviting me. OK, so, um, uh, so you know, th this day has been like all about lifting theorems. And I only ever proved one lifting theorem in my life, which is what I'm going to talk about today. That's because my main motivations come from approximation, algorithms, and hardness of approximation. So in some sense, lifting theorems are more like a utility to me than uh, you know my bread and butter. But you know, I'll still tell you how they are useful today. So it kind of also fits nicely in the progression of talks today. Like you know, we we saw uh, lifting theorems in the context of proof complexity, in communication complexity. Then the last talk was of extension complexity without lifting theorems. And now you know this talk is going to be about you know proving LP lower bounds and extension complexity lower bounds using lifting theorems. So it's kind of you know fitting. Uh, all right, so let's begin. So this is based on joint work with Raghu Meka and uh, Prasad Raghavendra. And it almost never happens to me that I can state the main result of a talk uh, on the first slide. But uh, it's possible here, so kind of excited about that. I'm going to do that. So the main result of it's this talk is going to be a lower bound on linear programming relaxations. So you know, uh, today I'm going to show you that there is some fixed constant delta naught. Think of it like 0 0.0000001, such that if you write a 2 to the n to the delta naught size LP relaxation, then such an LP relaxation has the following integrality gaps. Okay? Let's say you want to solve the max cut problem with such an LP. Then the integrality gap of any 2 to the n to the delta naught size relaxation would be at least 2. Similarly, max 2 sat, the number would be 4 thirds max 3 sat, the number would be 8 seventh, and so on. Now, these numbers appear funky, but actually they come from uh, the approximation ratio of a very simple algorithm, the algorithm that simply returns a random assignment. Okay? So, you know, the, one of the first randomized algorithms we learn in algorithms classes is, you know, how do you solve max cut? Well, here's one thing you can do, just simply return a random cut. And there's a very simple analysis that shows that in the expectation, the cut that you return would be half optimal. And what this result is saying is that, well, you know, even if you augment your trivial algorithm and use like a mega 2 to the n to the delta naught size LP to help you out, well, still not going to work out. You're still, in the worst case, going to suffer from a gap of 2, which is basically the same as, you know, the performance of the trivial random assignment algorithm. And similarly for, you know, max 2 sat, where, you know, the right number is 4 thirds and max 3 sat, where the right number is 8 seventh, and so on. So, you know, I, I, in this slide, I also want to somehow flash the main technique for you to look out. Now, this is not supposed to make sense right away, but this is, you know, something that you should look out uh, 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 as the talk progresses and, you know, whether I can justify it to you or not. So, the main technique of the talk is going to be almost like an upper bound instead of a lower bound, or at least that's how I would like to spin it. So, the way we prove this theorem is by showing that, let's say, you know, I give you a budget. Let's say that you can write a 2 to the n to the delta naught size LP, right? Then you could go and ask, okay, which constraint should I add? I have this budget of these many number of constraints. What LP should I write? What LP relaxation should I choose to, let's say, solve max cut? Well, it turns out that if you don't care about polynomial factor losses, then I can precisely describe a single fixed LP to you for any given size budget. And it's a well-studied LP. It's not some you know, uh, archaic, weird, uh, constructed LP. It's like a very well-studied LP. It has a name. It's called the Sherali Adams LP. And so somehow the main result of this talk is going to be that if you are given a budget of some size 2 to the n to the delta naught, then there is up to a polynomial factor loss a fixed LP, which is best possible LP in terms of the worst case integrality gap or approximation ratio that that LP could give you for solving any of these problems. Okay. Uh, and that's the Shirali Adams LP. And by just combining lower bounds that are known for Shirali Adams LP, you get the results out. You know, just use that Shirali Adams LP of that size as a lower bound, let's say of two for max cut, and you get you know the result on the main side. Now, before moving ahead, I want to like point out one one you know somewhat disappointing fact about LPs, which you may have already observed. We already know that we can greatly beat the approximation ratio of two for max cut problem, right? We can get something like uh, one over 0.878. Uh, by using semi-different programming and this hyperplane rounding that you may have heard about. Well, what this is saying is that if you want to somehow even do slightly better than 0.5, like forget achieving the guarantee that a very small SDP achieves, even if you like want to like do a little bit better than random assignment, you have to spend basically an exponential size budget for writing a linear program. 
And so, you know, it kind of shows that, you know, if you want to match the performance uh, of a simple SDP for, let's say, a problem like MaxCut, you have to really have exponential size linear programs. So this kind of, you know, shows you some gap between linear programs and semi-definite programs for, like, you know, basic problems like MaxCut. Incidentally, it turns out that this 2 to the n to the delta naught kind of result for MaxCut is tight. It turns out that uh, you don't need 2 to the n size LPs to replicate the performance of SDPs. You can do it with some 2 to the n, uh, 2 to the delta, 2 to the n to the delta naught for some fixed constant delta naught less than 1. This was proven just a few months ago. But okay, that's not what this talk is about. Okay, and so you know, this, so ours is not the first result that relates arbitrary linear programs to Shirali Adams LPs. This kind of a technology was first developed in this very nice paper of Chan, Lee, Raghavendra, and Stoyer from 2013. And uh, what they proved was basically a similar result, but with a worse bound. So in, in like their result implied that if you wanted, for example, to simulate uh, a quasi-polynomial LP, or let me just put it this way, if you applied the result, because it was like far from you know, being optimal in the way that I have written down uh, on this slide, you only obtained a quasi-polynomial lower bound. So somehow you, know, you could not obtain lower bound against exponential size linear programs. Your techniques kind of broke down at some quasi-polynomial bound. So the main, somehow the technical punch of what I'm gonna show you today is that we can somehow you know, take this connection and push it all the way uh, with just a polynomial factor loss between any LP and Shirley Adams LP, giving us an exponential uh, lower bound. And so somehow the key technical idea is going to be, uh, you know, showing lower bound on non-negative rank, which you already seen Makran's talk now, on certain kind of structured matrices, which are called as pattern matrices. And this we will prove using a lifting theorem. So you know, it all fits. It is a, it is a part of the same workshop. So there is going to be, there is going to be a lifting theorem. <laughs> okay. So that's, uh, that's basically the summary. So let's, uh, you know. Uh, uh, let's begin by, you know, uh, before I like tell you a little bit more about the result and how it works, let me, you know, show you a little bit of context. Now, this slide is dense, but the expectation is not that you read every single result written down here. The point I'm trying to make in this slide is that for specific linear programs, so, you know, you, so like people have considered various specific type of linear programs in, uh, you know, in literature like Shirali Adams LP, Lova Shriver LPs. You don't need to know what these are. You just need to know that they're very specific, well-defined, uh, uh, you know, linear programs. And because these are such important problems, people have considered the question of how good are these linear programs for solving, let's say, max cut, which is going to be my running example for, you know, the kind of problems I'm going to deal with today. And people have essentially figured out essentially all that we could. So, you know, we know the tight integrality gaps on all such, you know, various general notions of various specific LPs that we could write for max cut, max two side, et cetera. And so this talk is, you know, trying to go beyond these results and asking, well, okay, let's say I don't want to write any of these specific named LPs. I'm free to write any LP whatsoever as long as I have a size budget, how do I somehow uh, ascertain that this will not help me or can it help me? Good. So that's what we are after and this kind of a uh, effort was begun and formalized by Yanakakis as like Makran already showed you, so I'm going to be quick in this slide. And so this was 1988 and not much really happened after Yanakakis's, you know, um, uh, monumental work. Uh, until like 2012, where this area again broke open with this work of Fiorani, Massart, Pakuta, Tiwari, and De Wolf, who showed this two to the root and lower bound for the traveling salesman problem, uh, the TSP polytope. And since then, a lot of amazing works have happened. Again, the slide is too dense. You don't need to read everything. It's just there to impress you that a lot has happened since 2012. <laughs> yes? Ah, previous slide. Ah, good. So again, uh, it's kind of my bad that I use the word there, but it, it, I, just think of our rounds. So you know, because I've written it down, let me put it this way. These are not single LPs, but they are kind of you know a hierarchy of LPs. And it turns out that for every number r, which we call as rounds, there is like a n to the r size LP corresponding to it of Shirley Adams type or Lova Shriver type. And so, you know, for, for the purpose of this slide, you're just, just supposed to think of it as R as defining N to the R or N to the O of R size LP. Yes, so like exponent, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're supposed to think of them as uh, omega N rounds, meaning two to the omega N sized LPs. Good. So, yeah, a lot has happened since uh, 2012 in this direction of, uh, you know, proving extension complexity or lower bounds on arbitrary linear programs. And, you know, this work is going to be about uh, proving, um, exponential lower bounds uh, for approximating constraint satisfaction problems of which max cut, et cetera, are examples. Good. So I've been using this word uh, uh, so far, but you know, maybe the first question you should ask is what does it mean to be an arbitrary LP for max cut? What kind of LPs are you allowed to write? Like in principle, 
you could be like, you know, uh, sneaky and write the following LP. Take a graph G, compute its max cut via whatever algorithm, then add the constraint that max cut of G is, you know, smaller than something in some clever way. Of course, I can't possibly prove all the like lower bound against this LP, and that's because you somehow hard coded some information about the graph G, right? And so I have to be a little bit careful in what I mean when I say that you know I'm proving a lower bound against LP relaxations. And so I'm going to do what I'm going to do is like formalize what I mean by arbitrary LP for solving max cut, and then you know state the result and how we prove it. Okay? So before like, telling you what an arbitrary LP means, let's first of all see at least one LP, one natural LP for solving max cut. Um, and so let me remind you how a max cut problem looks like. You know, if you've not seen before, you know, you are given a graph, your task is to find a subset of vertices, and you are trying to maximize the number of edges in the cut defined by the set of vertices S. Now, it's a very simple uh, job to write this as a quadratic integer program, okay? So you can somehow, you know, um, uh, take a vector x, which takes values in plus minus one to the n. You can think of like, let's say, one as uh, one side of the cut and minus one labeled vertices as the other side of the cut. And you can somehow, you know, decide which edges in the cut by some simple quadratic function like one minus x j, x i, x j over two. And then just summing up, summing all these terms over, uh, you know, all the edges gives you the count of the number of edges in the cut, okay? And so just maximizing this uh, quadratic uh, function over all possible uh, excess in plus minus, plus minus one to the n is, you know, equivalent to the problem of solving max cut, okay? So, but I want to write a linear program for it. And, you know, this has, this particular formulation has lots of issues with it. Well, it's quadratic, it's not a linear, like it, it, it's over integer variables and so on. So we somehow have to fix it. And so how do we do it? You might have seen this before, but let me just do it for you anyway. So first, I have to somehow, you know, make this quadratic function linear. So here's one way to do it. I'm going to introduce new variables, yij, which are supposed to stand for whether the edge ij is included in the cut. So yij is kind of my proxy variable for 1 minus xi xj over 2 in this quadratic formulation. Okay? That's good. So now, you know, I can write down my objective as a linear function in yij's. <laughs> That's good. So I'm just trying to maximize the sum over all edges of yij's. Of course, you know, I have to add some constraints on yij's, otherwise, you know, they have no reason to be, you know, behave as cuts are supposed to behave. So the second thing I do is add any collection of valid constraints. So val what does valid mean? I can add a linear inequality constraint on yij's as long as this constraint holds for all cuts. So all yij's that can be obtained by some excess that define cuts they are a special class of yij's. They're not all possible vectors like that. Any inequality that holds for all of those vectors, I can add as a constraint, which is legit, right? Like if an inequality constraint is followed by all possible cuts, there's a legit constraint to add. I can add any such constraint. And any collection of such constraints will give me a valid uh, relaxation, okay? So here is, for example, one natural way to do this. The first thing I can observe is that, you know, yij's can take values only between zero and one. That's good. I can add these bounding constraints. I can also observe that if I take any triangle of vertices, i, j, k, then in any triangle, the max cut can cut at most two edges, right? Because it's a odd uh, cycle. And so I can add this odd three cycle constraint, this, you know, y, i, j plus y, i, k plus y, j, k less than equal to two means that I can cut at most two edges out of any triangle. And similarly, you know, if I was feeling funky one day, I could like do it for five edges and seven edges and so on. You know, there are various ways to, you know, add more inequality constraints, but this is supposed to give you an idea of one possible relaxation you might want to build for max cut. Okay? Good. So now that we've seen, you know, one specific LP for max cut, you know, it's kind of natural to understand what an arbitrary LP might look like. Okay? What are you allowed to do? So I'm going to take the procedures we did on the, the previous slide and just like, you know, allow them to be done in the most general possible way. Okay? So the first thing we did was we linearized the objective function. Okay? So here is what I'm going to allow you to do in most general, uh, in, in the most general setting. I'm going to allow you to take the graph G and represent it as a vertex, as a, as a vector V sub G in some M dimensional space. This M could be much larger than the number of edges. In the previous slide, the graph was represented as the zero one vector of which, is, which edge is being present. So it was like an N choose two dimensional vector. But now I'm allowing you know, other possible, you know, vector representations of the graph G, if, you know, that you might want to construct. It could be completely arbitrary representations of, you know, the graph. Similarly, you can take all possible cuts and, uh, you know, map them into vectors y sub s, okay? 
And the only restriction is that you should somehow, you know, map the graph <laughs> and the cuts to live in the same number of dimensions. As long as, you know, they are same dimensions, I should be able to take inner products of them and like write linear inequality constraints, okay? That's it. So for any mapping of the graph G into a vector V sub G, and for any system of mapping cuts S into, you know, uh, some vectors Y sub S, I can define an objective VG dot Y S, which would stand for, you know, the cut, uh, the, the value of the cut defined by the set of vertices S in the graph G, okay? So in the previous slide, VG was, you know, the indicator vector of the edges, and YS was, you know, this, uh, uh, this plus minus, one, sorry, zero one indicator of, uh, you know, IJ being cut for any given X. Does that make sense? Yes, exactly, yes. So this, yeah, this should hold for every graph. Yes, that's an important thing. So somehow, you know, I'm trying to construct a linearization for all possible graphs and all possible cuts of a fixed size at once. Good? The next step we did was add any, you know, valid inequality, set of inequality constraints. This step I'm going to call a relaxation step. And so, you know, at this point I allow you to choose any polytope which contains all the YSS corresponding to all possible SS. You know, like you had a way to take all possible cuts, the two to the n possible cuts, and map them into vectors. Well, any polytope that contains all of them, you can define, like and take any polytope that contains all of them, right, write down it in the inequality constraint form, and that's a valid, that's a valid set of inequalities. And you can take any of these, okay? That's it. So that's, uh, that's what my arbitrary LP for max cut looks like, okay? Now, I'm gonna care about two parameters of this LP. First, I'm gonna care about like what's the value of this LP, meaning if I take the LP value, the LP maximum of uh, the, the max cut uh, uh, relaxation produced this way, then what is it and how does it compare to opt of G, which is the true max cut value? And second, I'm gonna like care about the size of this LP, and I'm gonna measure it today by just the number of variables in the uh, LP plus the number of inequality constraints, okay? So M was the number of dimensions, so which also corresponds roughly to the number of, uh, you know, uh, up to a factor of two, I think it corresponds to the number of uh, variables, and then the number of inequality constraints defining P. Does it all make sense? Yeah? Can you say a bit about this the and then take Good. So, uh, Makaran kind of mentioned this particular comment multiple times that you could have chosen any set of valid inequalities to define the slack matrix. Well, I am choosing the inequality. This comment is not supposed to make general sense. So, if, this, if you don't follow, it's okay. It's not needed for the talk. But, you know, here yeah, I'm choosing the inequalities that look like max cut of G is less than or equal to the opt of G, for example. Okay, like they, the, the true max cut polytope which may have some very large description, does satisfy the inequality. It, it derives all the value inequalities, and I'm si kind of taking the polytope defined by those value inequalities. Okay, good. So, so that's, that's, that's the model of arbitrary LPs I'm gonna to think about. And now, you know, once I've defined the model, I'm gonna tell you about what it means to be a good model. So I'm gonna say that an LP, L, which, you know, so L, an LP, right, remember, is defined by the scheme of linearization we chose and the polytope P we chose. Now, for any such fixed linear program L, I can ask, uh, I can, I can, I, I'm gonna like measure its performance by how good an approximation it gives. This is where approximation plays in. So I'm gonna say that it gives me a C comma S approximation if for every graph for which the true max cut value is at most some small s, the LP maximum is at most some number small c, okay? And just for a sanity check, this number C, of course, is always gonna be bigger than or equal to S. Why is that true? Well, because we always chose the polytope P to be a relaxation. It always contains the true cut vectors. So I can always achieve the value S, the optimal of G. In general, I could achieve something larger because I have a relaxation. And you know, I'm trying to, I'm hoping that C is not too far from C, S if I'm trying to construct a, big, a, a good relaxation, okay? Very good. So now I'm kind of mostly rehashing Makran's talk at this point. So you know we are trying to understand when do C comma S approximating LP relaxations of some given small size exist. Okay. Now it's 
kind of actually the way I define makes it look extremely general. It's like how 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 at all do we reason about all possible linearizations and all possible polytopes seems kind of daunting. But you know, back in 1988, Yanakakis already made our life simple and you know showed that there is a fixed parameter that depends only on the problem. It does not need to know the linearization, it does not need to know the polytope. Fixed parameter just, just depends on max cut, for example, that completely determines the smallest LP that could achieve, let's say, for example, C comma S approximation. And so I'm going to define this parameter for you now. It's same as what Makan described, but I'm just going to do it in this new notation because that's what I need. Okay? So what Yanakakis did, or what Yanakakis would have done if he wanted to do max cut and <laughs> approximating setting, was he would look at this matrix where the rows are indexed by all possible graphs where the true max cut value is at most small s. Okay? So each row corresponds to a graph and the true optimum max cut is at most some small s. Okay? The columns correspond to all possible 2 to the n cuts. So these are graphs on fixed number of vertices, let's say n. Okay? And the g comma seth entry, so each entry is now indexed by a graph g and a cut s. The g comma seth entry is c minus the value, the number of edges in the cut at S in the graph G. Okay? So just by the description of the matrix, it should be clear that this matrix is non-negative. Why? Well, because the optimum value of G is at most S, C is bigger than or equal to S, so C minus cut G of S is always positive. So all, all the entries of this matrix are non-negative, so it's a non-negative matrix. Okay? Now, Yanakakis proved, or Yanakakis' proof implies that there is a property, there is a, there is a simple parameter of this matrix, which is called as a non-negative rank, which I represent as rank plus of this matrix. I'm going to call this matrix M cut, which completely determines, uh, you know, the, the smallest size of the LP relaxation that gives me a C comma S approximation for max cut, okay? And so that, that quantity is just this non-negative rank, and I'm going to define it for you uh, again in some sense because Makran already defined it for you before. So size in the quantity. Yeah. So size of the LP so uh, is the num like the dimension uh, uh, that the LP lives in, the number of variables plus the number of inequality constraints. Good. So uh, let me remind you what this non-negative rank is. Yes. What is the notation for G of S? Ah. Cut G of S means the size of the cut defined by the set of vertices S in the graph G. Okay, just like how many edges are there in the cut of vertices S in the graph G. Uh, yeah, like the number of edges crossing S in G. Good. So what is non-negative rank? So you know, the following is maybe not, maybe not the first definition you saw of rank, but you know, it's definitely something that you would agree with. The rank of a matrix is the minimum number of rank 1 matrices such that adding them all up gives me the original matrix. You can define rank, one, rank, you can define rank of a matrix as the smallest decomposition uh, into rank 1 matrices which when added up give me the original matrix. Okay? Now when I have a non-negative matrix, in principle I can ask that each of these terms, the rank 1 terms, they themselves be non-negative. Okay? In, a, in a rank decomposition, it's not needed that they be non-negative, right? Like, you know, negative terms could still add up to, you know, give me a non-negative matrix, but I could, in principle, ask that I also want the rank 1 terms to be non-negative. Well, if I ask that, then the quantity that I get is a non-negative rank. So, said in another way, the non-negative rank of a non-negative matrix is the least number of rank 1 matrices which are non-negative and which, when added up, give me the original matrix. Does it make sense? So in general, again, one sanity check, the non-negative rank of a matrix must at least be as large as the rank of the matrix. Because, you know, the non-negative decomposition is at least one rank decomposition of the same matrix. Good. So now, now you know, you know, uh, basically uh, what Ganakakis knew already. And, uh, uh, you know, now our goal reduces uh, to, so when we want to prove LP lower bounds, our goal reduces to just to somehow show that this fixed matrix M cut, let's say for max cut, you know, uh, has a large non-negative rank. Okay, that's our goal. Now, and in some sense, you know, non-negative rank is kind of the main quantity that gives connections to communication complexity, etc. Because these rectangles are rank one matrices, etc., etc. And you saw like the whole day of talks on that, but it's not important for us. 
So we want to prove a lower bound. All we want to do now is want to prove a lower bound on the non-negative rank of this fixed matrix. But again, like how do we do that? It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's a, it's a fixed matrix, but it's not like a clearly well understood matrix. Like if we understood the cut of all, uh, max cut of all graphs, then we'll not actually be standing here. So it's clearly, you know, not very easy to reason about this matrix. So the, the way we are going to do is we're going to find some structured sub matrix inside this matrix, okay? And we are going to prove a lower bound on the non-negative rank of this structured sub matrix instead. Okay, and this structured sub matrix is going to be something called as a pattern matrix and pattern matrix is described by a function f like the data that a pattern matrix takes is some function f. I'm going to define this in, in, in like again uh, more formally very soon, but basically right now take it as just a shorthand for some correctly structured matrix that I'm going to find as a sub matrix inside m cut and then prove a lower bound on this structured matrix to derive a lower bound on the whole matrix. Now, why is that second implication valid? Well, any rank one decomposition of the big matrix gives me a rank one decomposition, a non-negative rank one decomposition for the small matrix. And therefore, if I manage to prove a lower bound on the non-negative rank of the sub matrix, I would get one even on the original one. Okay, so far so good? Good, so what is this pattern matrix? That's where communication complexity, uh, uh, you know, kind of enters the picture. That's where also where the lifting theorems enter the picture. So I'm going to use notation and names which are inspired from communication complexity, but the names are not important. Like you can understand this without any knowledge of communication complexity, even though you actually have a lot now. So let's say that you're given a function on n bits, okay? So it maps n bits into real numbers. And I'm going to call this a one party function because it takes only one input, okay? In addition, you are given a two party function because I think of its input as coming from, as, as like split into two parts, each coming from some alphabet sigma, okay? And for whatever reasons, I call this two party function a gadget, okay? So the gadget maps, uh, you know, two inputs, each coming from this alphabet sigma into plus or minus one, okay? So given a one party function f of n bits, and a two-party gadget G, I can create a matrix indexed by sigma to the n on the rows and sigma to the n on the columns, okay, where the x comma yth entry is as follows, okay. At any x and y, so now, you know, each x and y is like a n length uh, uh, vector where each coordinate comes from this alphabet sigma, correct? That's what, you know, uh, sigma to the n means. So now what I'm going to do is to compute any entry, I look at, you know, the first block, the first entry in both X and Y, they are elements of sigma, okay? So I can apply the gadget G, I should have a picture here. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I, I look at these, you know, N blocks, X1 through Xn and Y1 through Yn, then I apply this gadget G to the first entry of X and Y, to the second entry of X and Y and so on, and this way I get n bits out, right? Because output of g lives in bits. And then I apply the f to this n bit output, okay? So it's like a completely syntactic operation that I did, okay? And I'm going to define this, I'm going to define this resulting matrix produced as the pattern matrix of f with gadget g, okay? Good, okay. So I promised you that the way I'm going to prove a lower bound on the non-negative rank of m cut is by finding a pattern matrix as a sub matrix inside it, okay? And so at some point, my task will reduce to proving a non-negative rank lower bound on such a pattern matrix, right? So that's where, you know, lifting theorems come in because lifting theorems somehow, you know, like at a at, at like philosophical level, they relate some hardness measure of this matrix M sub F to some other hardness measure of the single party function F. And you saw several examples, uh, uh, you know, of this phenomenon uh, earlier today. And, you know, these are, uh, I, I don't even think they're all the examples that you saw today. They're just a small subset where we show that some natural notion of complexity of this matrix MF can be lower bounded in terms of some natural measure of the complexity of F. And so, you know, one example you saw, for example, was the decision tree size or depth of the function F and, you know, the deterministic communication complexity of M sub F. 
but you know there are several several such examples and we are actually after you know a very similar theorem today right we are interested in understanding the non negative rank of the matrix m sub f so maybe we should really ask what complexity measure of this function f should somehow relate to it could i somehow lower bound the non negative rank of the pattern matrix m sub f in terms of some natural complexity measure of the function f okay so that's exactly what i'm going to do and to tell you this uh, uh, complexity measure i'm just going to make one definition okay so i'm going to define a function on n bits to positive reals as a de hunter if it depends only on d out of the n variables it formally is a function of okay now you may be familiar with the more natural usage of the term de hunter to refer to just as functions of d variables i'm kind of plugging in non negativity without actually adding a new terminology for it because well you know that's what i care about today okay so given that definition the non negative degree of f which is i'm going to write as degree plus of f is the smallest number of non negative de hunters okay whose sum equals f okay now again let me relate it uh, to something that you're more familiar with the polynomial degree of f is the least uh, 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 least integer d that f can be written as a linear combination of monomials of degree d right so this definition is almost the same except that the linear combination if you in fact like restrict to positive monomials like conjunctions or something then this definition is just telling you that the linear combination should only use non negative coefficients so it's basically you know polynomials with non negative coefficients like almost exactly equal to polynomials with non negative coefficients okay and this should like almost remind you of this non negative rank versus rank business it's like it was also it almost felt like if i just restrict signs that's what i get there and it's obviously not accidental because they're going to be related to each other okay so this is a non negative degree of f and so what turns out to be not that hard to prove is the following upper bound that you can somehow show that the non negative rank of this pattern matrix m sub f is so let's maybe parse this uh, notation in a second but basically it can be upper bounded in terms of the non negative degree of the starting function f okay and the size of the alphabet sigma and so the precise function is that it's going to be some exponential in the non negative degree of f times log of the size of the alphabet sigma all right so that's the upper bound the main result is going to be almost matching lower bound okay so let me parse this out for you so i'm going to be given a function f which is non negative of course you know to talk about non negative degree i have to look at non negative functions now ignore this expectation f equals 1 constraint for now okay it's coming because there's going to be some additive thing going on so i have to have some scale parameter in so you can ignore ef equals 1 the gadget g the the alphabet sigma is going to be b dimensional hypercube okay where b is at least some big constant times log n let's say 10 okay the gadget i'm going to use so this is not going to be true for an every gadget the lower bound is not going to hold for every gadget it's going to be true for an appropriately chosen gadget the gadget g i'm going to use is the inner product gadget okay so you already i i think you all by now know what the ip function is but just you know to set the record straight g you know takes this b bit two b bit strings alpha and beta and this just maps uh, uh, alpha and beta to you know the parity of the sum of alpha i dot beta i okay so you 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 this is all good like the, the notation and the setup is all good good so then under this like for this for this ip, IP gadget and a function f uh, i'm going to show you that the non negative rank of the pattern matrix of f with the gadget g is going to be uh, lower bounded by exponential in something that looks almost like the upper bound okay it has a degree plus term the non negative degree term and it has a size of log of the size of the alphabet term which is b the only difference is that i don't have the non negative degree of f is a non negative degree of f plus some additive shift okay now here is the one way to think about it if i add a positive number to a function f i kind of make it only more positive so what it actually means is that you can only reduce the non negative degree by adding by shifting a function by some positive amount 
So in general, the non-negative degree of f plus, let's say, some tiny 100 over n is, you know, smaller than or equal to the non-negative degree of f. So in principle, this lower bound is a bit weaker than what would have been if there was degree plus f there. But we are saying that, okay, as long as you have a function which, whose non-negative degree, degree does not change much by this tiny shift, it's going to be essentially a matching lower bound, okay? And now this, because I have an additive shift 100 over n, I kind of normalized EF to be 1. Like, you know, otherwise this additive shift doesn't make sense. Basically, we're saying that if, if function f, the typical value of f is like order 1 large, then the shift we have to include here is like 1 over n large, okay? Does this, does the statement make sense? And so, you know, it's not, I mean, it's written on the board, it's written on the slide right up here. It's like, you know, it's going to be constant, it's tight up to like constant factors appearing in this exponent inside here and this additive shift, okay? Okay, good. So, you know, this is tight. And so it's kind of nice to compare it to, you know, earlier results uh, 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 and, you know, what they were proving. So I told you this result of Chan, Lee, Raghavendra, and Strider, and I, I kind of mentioned that, you know, they were able to prove a quasi-polynomial lower bound for, you know, solving max cut uh, to an approximation ratio better than 2. And, you know, I told you that the main result of this talk is basically improving their lower bound to exponential. So you can ask, can I somehow interpret the result in this framework, right? So it turns out that you can, they don't state their theorem this way, but somehow I think the nice way to understand their paper is to really look at their stuff also as a lifting theorem, except that they are lifting to slightly different properties, okay? Instead of looking at the non, uh, uh, instead of looking at the non-negative rank of MF, they actually look at approximate non-negative rank of MF, and it kind of means what you think it means. But the non-negative rank of, you know, MF is basically, you know, the smallest non-negative rank of any matrix which is close, you know, uh, entry-wise uh, to my matrix within delta, okay? So, so they, they actually related the approximate non-negative rank of the pattern matrix M sub F to approximate non-negative degree of the function F. So up to this approx word thrown in there, they basically had the same kind of lifting theorem, and their lifting theorem is also tight. So, so they proved the right lifting theorem for the right, the quantities they considered, except the lower bound is weak. And actually we can explain it away very easily. It turns out that this M cut matrix is somewhat weird. The M cut matrix has high non-negative rank, well that's what gives it the large LP complexity, but has a at most quasi-polynomial approximate non-negative rank. So, you know, any, any notion of lower bound that proves a non-negative rank lower bound by actually lower bounding the approximate non-negative rank will never manage to prove, you know, better than quasi-polynomial lower bound. And that's kind of what was happening in the, in the previous uh, works. And so somehow, you know, I guess, you know, one key kind of conceptual thing here is that, you know, we are kind of somehow uh, have, to, have to really exploit the distinction between approximate non-negative rank and the non-negative rank to prove the right, right lower bound here. Okay, good, so that's the result that I want to tell you about, but you know, before, uh, I, I guess it's, it's want to make, so this result is kind of dated, but I, I'm, I'm giving a talk here because, uh, you know, that's the only lifting theorem I've proven. So this result is like two years old from 2017, and so a year after, uh, you know, Gears, uh, uh, Tony, and Thomas Watson uh, gave this uh, cool proof for query to communication lifting for BPP, and using those ideas, uh, James Lee, Raghumeka, and Thomas Widdick were able to give a slightly simpler proof of the same result. And so that's not what I'm going to present because I don't know that proof. Uh, but, uh, but basically, you know, there might, I, I don't think there's a manuscript out uh, with that. Uh, it just like apparently has appeared in some talks. But hopefully at some future date, there would be a manuscript with a simpler proof. Anyway, good. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the proof a little bit. So, okay, so you kind of saw this piece already, right? You want to prove a lower bound on the LP size for approximating max cut? Well, it's enough to prove a non-negative rank lower bound on the M cut matrix. So I'm going to prove a lifting theorem to prove a lower bound on the non-negative rank of some M sub F. And the F, you know, somewhere it has to come up that there is a hard instance of max cut, right? Like, like we are proving hardness of max cut, so hard graph should somewhere come in. So this F is going to be related to the hard, the hard instance for max cut, okay? And I told you that we are going to reduce proving lower, like we are, we are somehow going to show that the best LP for solving max cut is the Sherali Adams LP. So the F is going to be related to the integrality gap instance for this specific LP. 
So what we're going to do is like take f that comes from the integrality gap for Shirley Adams, then find the pattern matrix m sub f inside the m cut matrix and prove a non-negative rank lower bound on that matrix, okay? So that's basically this picture, but I'm going to rush through it. And just in case you were curious, that's the form of f. So fx would basically be 1 minus epsilon minus g0 of x. This 1 minus epsilon is your c. Like remember the c comma s approximation we were talking about? So s is really half for max cut, while c is like close to 1. That's what gives you the gap of 2. And so the function we are going to use is like just 1 minus epsilon minus g0 of x. And zero, g0 of x just means, you know, the value of the cut defined by x in the graph g0. And g0 is this hard instance. Okay? Anyway, so rest of the slide can be ignored. And you can just take home this last corollary, which is that the fact that G0 is a hard instance for max cut for Shirali Adams LP is equivalent to a non-negative rank lower bound on this function 1 minus epsilon minus, you know, this G0 of X or cut of G0, okay? So basically what we are saying is that the Shirali Adams lower bound when interpreted correctly gives you a non-negative degree lower bound on this, you know, shifted cut function. Okay, so now we are doing good, right? We have a function with a non-negative rank lower bound. We want to take the pattern matrix, prove a lower bound on that, find it inside the M cut matrix and we are done. Good, so that's this step. And so now let's see how much of this I can tell you about. But the high level part of this argument is very similar to the two other talks we saw today, okay? How do you prove you know, uh, how do you prove that uh, MF's non-negative rank is lower bounded in terms of the non-negative degree of F? Well, you, you, you know, you, you go in the contrapositive. You say, suppose MF has some small non-negative rank towards a contradiction. Then you want to somehow extract a representation for F that implies that it has a small non-negative degree. And then it like, you know, contradicts this known result and that's why, you know, we are done. That's basically the structure of the argument. So, we are not going to be able to do that, as I kind of already told you. We are actually going to derive a contradiction to f plus 1 over n, this tiny shift of f having, you know, small non-negative degree. Now, it turns out that for this, this hard function that comes out of the Shirley Adams instance, we can not only prove a lower bound on the non-negative degree of like, you know, 1 minus epsilon minus g0, we can actually twiddle this, you know, epsilon a little bit, like add 1 over n, etc., and like, it also has no high non-negative degree. So that kind of doesn't bother us at all here. So that's kind of a, maybe a partial answer to this question from before. In some cases, it does not matter. In some cases, the non-negative degree does not really drop. Good. So now, you know, what does a simple representation for such a function mean? Like a simple representation that implies a non-negative degree upper bound is going to be what I'll call a conical junta approximation, okay? A conical junta is just, you know, this positive coefficient polynomial that we referred to before. And so instead of constructing a exact representation for f, which is a conical junta, I'm going to instead construct an approximate representation for f, which is the conical junta, and from there conclude that f plus 1 over n must have a small, uh, you know, non-negative degree. That's basically, you know, slightly more details for the step number two, okay? Let's see. So now you kind of see maybe this, this piece at least making some sense, this junta approximation. This junta approximation is, you know, somehow the, the, the proof, you know, is going in the reverse direction. You, you assume that you have a low non-negative rank. You, you assume that MF has a small non-negative rank. You want to somehow, you know, get a junta approximation for F, and then you'll be able to complete the proof. Now the key technical piece in getting this junta approximation for F from small non-negative rank of M sub F is this piece called as decomposing high entropy distributions, which I want to spend five minutes on. Okay, so I'll spend five minutes on this piece because that's basically the key technical piece. Okay, so you know, in, the, in, the, in, in some older versions of the talk, I used to say that uh, I'm going to say a controversial statement that communication complexity is all about rectangles, but today I learned that it's not controversial at all. <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, it's just the truth. Good. So, so, so let me tell you, you know, how this, uh, uh, how this piece works and how it fits. So remember we had a matrix of this form, you know, it was indexed on rows and columns by elements of sigma to the n, right? And its entries were, you know, uh, f evaluated at g to the n applied to, you know, x and y, where x and y are row and column indices, right? 
So let's look at rectangles. Well, because that's a fun thing to do. <laughs> so let's look at a rectangle which is defined by A and B, okay, two subsets of rows and columns. For a given rectangle A and B, I can define the following quantity A sub R, okay. Now, if I look at any rectangle, it has x comma y's, various pairs of x comma y's. At every x comma y, I can apply this g to the n gadget and get a string of n bits out, right? Because that's what g to the n does, right? It, it takes like the first components of xs and applies g and second and so on. So now I can ask, how many times does a element of plus one minus one to the n, let's say z, occur inside, you know, g to the n applied to elements of this rectangle, okay? That's this function a sub r, okay? So I am interested in understanding how simple is this function for whatever reason, okay? So in fact, more generally, instead of like dealing with rectangles, I'm going to generalize them and look at all product distributions. So the thing about this a comma b was that I was gonna choose x from a at random and y from b at random and that's the way to choose a random entry from the rectangle. And so all I'm going to remember about this process that it was a product distribution over entries. And so take any product distribution, let's say defined by u and v, okay, which you can secretly continue to think of it as rectangles. I can ask a u v of z and how simple is it, okay? So let's maybe look at uh, a couple, uh, you know, examples to get a sense of what's happening. Let's first look at the simplest setting when the u comma v, the product distribution, is just uniform. That corresponds to the whole matrix being the rectangle, by the way, okay? So this one is easy. So how, what's the distribution of g to the n applied to x comma y when x and y are picked at random from, you know, u and v? Well, the inner product, you know, is like balanced function. So g to the n of x and y is gonna be literally uniform over plus one minus, minus one to the n, right? So g to, the n, g to the n is uniform, and therefore, the frequency of all elements of plus one minus one to the n is the same. And so a u v of z is a constant function. Good? Okay, let's look at like, you know, one more example, and then, and then I'll end. Let's now, you know, think of a distribution where the first t bits, the first t blocks are fixed, the rest of the blocks are still uniform. Then what happens to g to the n? Well, the first t entries will be some fixed value. The rest will still behave as uniform. And so this time, a u v will depend only on what's happening to the first t bits of z. So a u v is a t junta. And finally, I'm gonna rush through it. Actually, it turns out that you don't even need this unfixed part to be completely uniform. As long as they have sufficiently high entropy in each block, it's enough to draw the same conclusion and this is the first time you use the fact that G is an inner product gadget. It turns out that if you just have high entropy things here, because it is something called as a two source extractor, G to the N applied to this high min entropy part still gives you something close to uniform. Anyway, so A U V is still close to a T junta, and so the main result that we prove here is that this is actually true in general, that if U and V uh, correspond to, uh, let me just rush to it and let's say just, I'm gonna just flash this theorem and end. So if, if u and v are distributions, which correspond to high min entropy distributions, meaning that they are correspond to, they, they, they look like large rectangles, then they, the, the product distribution uv can be decomposed into things which look like t bits fixed and then uniform on the rest, plus some tiny error term, okay? And so basically we represent a uvs as approximate t juntas, and it turns out that you can, if mf has a, low non-negative rank decomposition, then you can, you can somehow use the simplicity of AUV and the fact that AUV is approximated by T junta to actually construct an approximator which is a T junta or a conical combination of T junta for the function f. This part is not gonna make sense, so let me just end. Maybe I'll flash this slide. Okay, I'll stop, yes. How is this decomposition theorem different from the, like, the GLMWZ? Good, that's because I rushed through the important slide uh, there. So here is somehow the main part. So GLMWZ also have a decomposition theorem which looks exactly like this, but it holds for a single distribution. So their theorem can be thought of as saying the following, that if you have a high min entropy distribution U, 
then you can somehow approximate it by a fixed part and a uniform part and the fixed part is going to be not that large. Somehow in this case we need that both UV when they have high mean entropy can be written exactly in this form and that the fixed part should be aligned. And this turns out to be somehow one of the key aspects where the theorem has to differ. But anyway like this aligned, uh, yeah so we have to somehow approximate this product distribution UV by some sort of aligned conjunctive blockwise dense thingy which is this last uh, thingy. So that's maybe one main difference. The other main, the other difference is that the error we get is actually needs to be much stronger and that's kind of where this alignedness comes in. So it's like you know you could have used individually, you can, you, you could have used this decomposition individually on U and V and use them to get some aligned thingy but that has a huge like much larger error. So you like because you construct this decomposition already in its aligned form, you actually get managed to get a much smaller exponentially small error. And so that turns out to be important in getting this exponential lower bound. Anyway, yes? The non-negative rank like where the previous talk is uh, comes up when you are looking at the extension complex. Yes. So what kind of setting gives rise to the approx degree? Like Right, so again I kind of rushed through the slide but it turns out that it is kind of very nice serendipity but it is like there is this specific LP called as Shirali Adams linear program, it is like a hierarchy of linear programming relaxations and it turns out that integrality gaps for you know solving constraint satisfaction problems using this LP exactly correspond to the shifted functions having high uh, you know non-negative degree. So it is like whenever you prove that a certain fixed LP called as a Shirali Adams LP cannot solve let us say for example max cut then it gives you that this 1 minus epsilon minus the max cut function must have a high non-negative degree. Turns out to be essentially equivalent as statements. Does it make sense? Uh, I was asking about the, the approx degree like you mentioned in the previous paper. Oh, where does approx degree come in? Yeah. So all the papers were really trying to prove lower bounds on you know non-negative rank and therefore non-negative degree. But it's like you know the techniques you use, like the techniques the previous papers were using, actually lower bounded not just degree but also approximate degree, and not just rank, non-negative rank, but also approximate non-negative rank, and that's why they suffered from this uh, disadvantage that they could not go beyond quasi-polynomial. The attempt was the same except that their techniques somehow applied to this more general notion, and therefore could only result in a weaker bound. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Uh, does framework extend to say LPs where the constraints depend simply on every LP you have a constraint? Say excellent question um, and in general the answer is no. Basically and it is kind of related to you know uh, the, the talk that Makran was uh, giving. It is like you know for this matching for example, it is like one canonical example where somehow you know uh, some constraints that depend on the graph kind of play into the polytope that is maybe one way to think about it. At, at least the polytope is not like a simple polytope like plus 1 minus 1 to the n and there for example we don't have any strategy that proves a lower bound by proving a lifting theorem. We kind of have this hard coded uh, specific strategies like Makran showed. Uh, you said something for vertex covers in your initial, so vertex cover I assume that the LP will require your constraint. Yes, so this talk does not prove uh, any lower bound on vertex cover even though an excellent formulation lower bound for vertex cover is known this method does not prove it. Thank you.